Are you tired? Worn out? Feeling the weight of it all? He says, Come to me, all who are tired and carrying heavy loads. Come to me, and I will give you rest. Learn the unforced rhythms of grace. I won't lay anything heavy or ill-fitting on you, and you'll learn to live light and free. My yoke is easy, and my burden is light. Come to me. Uh, we are in the third week of a series called Stress Less. You know, we live in a world that is so stressed out. Everybody's burned out and, you know, people are, are working hard and they don't have time for what matters most and the anxieties of life are weighing them down. But, but that's not what God wants for us. God wants us to have peace and joy and hope. He wants us to stress less, to put our trust in Him. And our, our key verse for this series has been Luke chapter 21, where Jesus is talking to His disciples uh, about end time events, and He's preparing them for some of the hardships that, that they're going to have to endure. And basically says, listen, there's going to be there's going to be external stress all around you, circumstantial stress, things going on, but you need to be careful that that stress doesn't get inside of you and weigh your heart's down. And so we've been looking at four areas that people are the most stressed about. You can go back and catch up online. So far we've talked about our schedules. We've talked about our workplace. Uh, in the weeks to come, we're going to be talking about relationship stress and financial stress. Uh, those, according to the APA, are the four areas that we are the most stressed about. But that study was done before the whole like coronavirus craziness, so I decided to add an extra week. And today, uh, we're going to learn how to stress less in the unexpected storm. So if you got your Bibles, go ahead and turn with me to Mark chapter 4, where Jesus asks a very piercing question. And we think about Jesus, we usually think of him as being the one with all of the answers. And he is, but he's also very good at asking questions. And many times the question that Jesus asks are challenging. You know, they force us to examine our own hearts, to examine our faith, our integrity, our beliefs. And for those of you here today, and uh, you're in the middle of a trial, there's kind of a storm going on in your life, Jesus is going to ask the question, why are you so afraid? Why are you so afraid? And I'm excited because I believe that the truth of God's word is going to come alive and bear fruit in your life. I believe that God is going to build your faith. And even though the circumstances around you may seem intimidating, 2 Timothy 1.7 says that God has not given you a spirit of fear or timidity. He's given you a spirit of power, of love, and of a sound mind. And the context for Mark chapter 4, the setting is basically that Jesus was teaching from a boat. So if you can picture this, you know, there's these huge crowds gathered all around the shore. And Jesus is out a little ways from shore uh, teaching the people. They kind of formed like a, a natural amphitheater. And so he's been there uh, preaching all day long. And so he says to his disciples, he says, all right, guys, let's... Let's go away from the crowd. Let's go to the other side of the sea. And the boat, which was his pulpit, is about to become his sermon illustration. So with that in mind, let's dive into uh, Mark chapter 4, verse 35. It says, That day, when evening came, he said to his disciples, Let us go over to the other side. Leaving the crowd behind, they took him along, just as he was where? In the boat. He was in the boat. There were also other boats with him. And in verse 37, Scripture says that a furious squall came up. In other words, like a crazy storm just exploded out of nowhere. And the waves broke over the boat so that it was nearly swamped. Now, I don't know if you've ever been in a boat that you thought was going to sink 
But these guys are freaking out. I mean, they're thinking, we're going to drown. Life as we know it is over, which is why the next verse is so funny to me, because there's just, there's just panic and stress and everything happening around the ship. But Jesus, in verse 38, was in the stern, sleeping on a cushion. Which, as a preacher, I get this. Okay, after a long day of teaching, I guarantee you, he was tired. There's... There's Sunday afternoons where I've, I've had days where I just preach sermon after sermon and, and like I sleep hard. And so Jesus is, he's sleeping in the stern. He's at rest. He's not, he's not freaking out. He's not worried. And this isn't one of my points. This is just a little bonus content for you today. Can I just say that right now, many of us didn't see this coming. There, there's some unexpected things but can I just say that Jesus is not caught off guard? You know, God's not out there going, oh no, what are we going to do now? Listen, he's, he's the beginning and the end, okay? He's not caught off guard. Man, he's at, he's at peace, he's in control, he's at rest. But the disciples in our text, they, they run down, they woke him up and they said, teacher, don't you care if we drown? Like, like the boat is going down, you're down, you're just sleeping. Don't, don't you care what happened to us? In verse 39, Jesus got up, he goes out, and he rebuked the wind. If you can picture this, Jesus goes, starts talking to the wind, and he said to the waves, quiet, be still, and the wind died down. Just like that, it was completely calm. And he says to his disciples, why are you so afraid? Do you guys still have no faith? And at this, they were terrified, and they asked each other, who is this? Even the wind and the waves obey him. Yeah, I read that the Sea of Galilee is about 680 feet below sea level, and it's surrounded by all of these mountains. And so according to the experts, this is the perfect place for a storm to just blow up with little warning. Like one minute, it's a, it's a beautiful day. And then out of nowhere, you know, everything changes. These massive stores, storms roll over the mountains. And the same is true for us in life metaphorically. Sometimes life can just be so good and so normal. And then out of nowhere, just boom, this storm hits. You know, it could be things were going great at work. And then, bam, all of a sudden you're, you're out of a job. You know, it could be you go to the doctor to check something out. And, and it's just regular. And suddenly you've got horrible news. Could be the unexpected loss of a loved one, and it just man, it comes out of nowhere. It feels like the rug's been pulled out from underneath your feet. Maybe something happened in your marriage. It could be financially. You are making a forward progress, and then something breaks or gets stolen, and it's expensive, or you know the world goes crazy, and people are getting sick, and things are shutting down, and your kids can't go to school, and you can't work, and stores are running out of basic necessities because everyone's in panic. I mean, hypothetically, like, you know, that I guess that could happen. You know, I don't know. We could run scenarios all day long. But the reality is we do find ourselves in the middle of things that we just didn't see coming, in the middle of things that we certainly would not have chosen. And so I want to give you today two things to remember when you're in the storm. If you're taking notes, number one, Jesus is with you in the boat. And maybe as you're writing that down, you'll just personalize it right now. Just, just write down, Jesus is with me in the boat. Man, just speak that to yourself. Listen, you are never alone. God is with you even in a storm. You know, verse 37 says, a furious squall came up. The waves broke over the boat so that it was nearly swamped. And where was Jesus? He was in the boat, in the stern, sleeping on a cushion. Now, a lot of people think, okay, wait a minute, pastor. If I'm with Jesus, there shouldn't be a storm, right? I mean, like, like if I'm a Christian, it should just be smooth sailing all the time. But, but that's not biblically accurate. That's not what Jesus says. In fact, in John 16, 33, Jesus says, in this world, you will have trouble. But he says, take heart, for I've overcome the world. Oh, sure, you're going to have troubles. You're going to find yourself in the middle of a storm, but take heart because the one who overcame the world 
is with you. Romans 8, 11 says the same spirit that raised Christ from the dead is alive in you. Deuteronomy 38 says that the Lord himself goes before you and he will be with you. He will never leave you nor forsake you. So do not be afraid. Do not be discouraged. Why? Because Jesus is in the boat and that changes everything. I mean, just think about Daniel uh, in the lion's den, one of my favorite uh, stories growing up, still is to this day. Uh, Daniel was a very godly man. He was obedient. Uh, he stood out from the crowd. He distinguished himself with integrity and exceptional character. He just kept getting promoted. And some guys who were jealous of Daniel tricked the king into putting this law in place that would trap him. See, Daniel was a man of prayer. Three times a day, he would kneel before the Lord and he would pray to his God. And so these guys, they went searching for some kind of fault, some way that they could, you know, trip him up or get him out of the picture. And this was the best they could come up with. So they got the king to put this law in place that said anyone who didn't pray or to pray to any God or anything but him would be thrown into a den of man-eating beasts. Now, when Daniel heard the news, guess what he did? Man, he went home and he prayed to God. He got caught, and because of that, he was thrown into the lion's den, but God was with him even in that pit. An angel of the Lord showed up and closed the mouth of the lions. You know, in Daniel chapter 3, uh, some other young men in that same time period, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, got thrown into this blazing furnace because they refused to bow down and worship an image of gold. You know, King Nebuchadnezzar at that time, he, he built this image. It was 90 feet high, 9 feet wide. And he ordered everyone in the kingdom to, to bow down low and to worship this, this image. And everyone did except three men stood tall. They stood out, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And so the king was furious. He had them tied up. He, he cranked the furnace up seven times hotter than it was before. And man, he gave them a death sentence. He threw them into the furnace to watch them burn. But after he did, he's, he says, wait a minute. He says, guys, didn't we throw three men into the fire? And they says, yes, true, we did, three. And he says, I see four men loose, and they are walking in the midst of the fire. And they're not hurt. And he says, the form of the fourth is like the Son of God. And can I just suggest that you may never know how good the presence of God is until you're in the middle of the fire, until you're at the bottom of the pit, until you're in the middle of the storm. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego are saying, man, I thought it was just us, but there's someone else here with us. It's the presence of God. I know the fire's hot, and I know this is like my worst nightmare, but somehow we're not getting burned because his presence changes everything you may find yourself in a storm right now but remember you are in the storm with his presence and you will experience his peace to the point that people may look at you even now in the midst of everything that's going on in our world right now people may look on at you and say how are you getting through this you know, I don't get it. How are you enduring this? How come you know, the world's falling apart, but you're not? You know, why is it that you have so much peace in the middle of the storm? And my prayer is that you'll be able to say to them, it's because Jesus is in my boat. It's because I'm not alone. It's because the author of life is living inside of me. Jesus is in my boat. He's in my house. He's in my marriage. He's in my finances. And because he's with me, I can rest in his strength, and in his comfort, and in his power, even in the middle of a storm. Listen to me, church. Never let the presence of a storm cause you to doubt the presence of God. Psalm 46 and verse 1 says that God is our refuge, that he is our strength, and he is an ever-present help in trouble. He's with me. He's with you in the storm. Psalm 23, 4 says, Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, 
I will fear no evil. Why? Because my God is with me. Okay, he never promised that the storm wouldn't rock you, but he does promise to be with you. He's on the boat. He's in the fire. He's in the pit. He's at school. He's at work. He's in the car. He is ever present. Psalm 139 and verse 7 says, Lord, where can I go from your spirit? Where can I flee from your presence? If I go up to the heavens, you're there. If I make my bed in the depths, you are there. If I rise on the wings of the dawn, if I settle on the far side of the sea, even there your hand will guide me. Your right hand will hold me fast. It's a matter what you're going through right now, no matter what storm you're facing, remember that Jesus is with you in the boat. And number two, Jesus is working for your good. He's with you in the boat and he's working for your good. You know, Romans 8, 28 says, we know that in all things, okay, the good things and the bad things, the things that were glad happened and the things that we wish never would have happened, man, we can know that in all things, God is working for the good of those who love him, for those who've been called according to his purpose. And let me just tell you, church, uh, that's you. We've been talking about the last several weeks. God has a purpose for your life. God loves you. And so you can know that no matter what, he is working for your good. Yeah, I love that song we sing around here called Waymaker. There's a bridge that says, even when I don't see it, you're working. Even when I don't feel it, God, you're working. And amen, in times like this and uncertainty, we've got to remind ourselves of the truth of God's living word. Know that, hey, even in the middle of the storm, Jesus is working for my good. He's, he's doing something not only for me, but he's doing something in me. You know, God is so good that he can even use the storms of life to produce good things inside of us. Like he uses them in the long run for our benefit. That's why James says in James chapter one, he says, hey, count it all joy, pure joy, my brothers, when you, whenever you face trials of many kinds, okay? Now, most of you, that's probably not your first response or reaction to, to trials, but James says, count it joy. Move to the state of worship within your soul because you're so full of joy because you know, here's what you know, that the testing of your faith develops perseverance. You know, something living inside of you. James says that perseverance must finish its work so that you, man of God, and you, woman of God, would be mature and complete and not lacking anything. You know, I think sometimes we look at people that we admire, we think of people who are just rock solid in their faith and, and they're mature in Christ, and we kind of think they were just born that way. Like they just, like I don't know, they got it and I didn't. Uh, but I can promise you, I mean you go to them and you ask them, I guarantee they've been through some storms with Jesus that have brought them to that point of, of solid faith in him. They know his faithfulness. They know his presence. They've learned that there's purpose in every single storm, that God is often doing something in us and teaching us in the middle of life storms that we couldn't learn any other way. And it's produced a harvest of righteousness in their lives. You know, that's been my experience. And uh, honestly, at the end of the day, my faith is not in the boat. My faith is in the one who is in the boat. Yeah, you know, personally, I've went through the storms and, and because of that, I'm different. I'd even say better off because Jesus was with me in the boat. Jesus was working for my good, working in my life. And when you know that Jesus is on the job, there's nothing to fear because, man, nothing is too hard for him. Nothing's too difficult. Nothing's impossible for our God. And I'm sure there's many of you that have been dealing this past week with, with fear and worry. The storm has just, it's hit you hard and it's hit you fast and you're freaking out a little bit. Like, you're the reason that the shelves are bare at Walmart. 
Thank you for that, by the way. You know, but kind of like the disciples in our text, you know, they were just panicking, right? The storm hit. Things didn't look good. The boat's probably going down, so they're screaming at Jesus, wake up. And what does Jesus do? I love it. Verse 39, he got up and he rebuked the wind. He said to the waves, quiet, be still, and the wind died down. That raging storm, I mean, one word from Jesus, and that raging storm went completely calm. And can you imagine that moment, what it would have been like to be in the boat, to see that firsthand? Everything dies down, and Jesus looks at his disciples I picture him with like a, seriously, guys. He says, why are you so afraid? Man, you've been with me. Don't you remember me opening those blind eyes and, and healing deaf ears? Yeah. Man, don't you remember? Like, I, I'm the author of the life. Like, like I'm, I'm with you. He says, why are you so afraid? Do you still have no faith? And then they were terrified. After the storm went down, they were terrified at what they just saw. And they asked each other, who is this that even the wind and the waves obey him? Listen, don't miss the power of what just happened here. Okay, the fear of the storm turned into a holy fear of the Lord. The fear of what might happen to them transferred into a reverential, holy, off-filled fear of God. They realized, wait a minute, this guy's the boss of the waves. Okay, he's bigger than the storm. And Christians, I just want to remind you today that Jesus is bigger than the storm. So why are you so afraid? You know, have you forgotten that Jesus is in your boat? that he's for you, that he's worth with you, that he is working for your good. And I'm telling you, listen, the more you get to know him, and, and as you've endured some storms with him in your life, you begin to learn. And when storm hits, you know, you might initially be afraid. You know, that might be the first response because the boat looks like it's going to sink. And that's not good. But, but suddenly, man, you're reminded of who your God is, and you realize that your hope is not in the boat, but your soul is anchored in the Lord, and that changes everything. You know, Psalm 20 and verse 7 says, Some trust in chariots and some in horses, but we, oh, we trust in the name of the Lord our God. They are brought to their knees and fall, but we rise up and stand firm. Amen. I'm praying that for the church right now in this time of, of uncertainty, in this time of, of chaos, in this time of man, enduring a big storm, that the people of God would rise up and stand firm. That we would remember that Jesus is with us in the boat, that he's working for our good, that he's bigger than the storm, that hey, my soul is anchored in the Lord. Jesus is in my marriage, he's in my house, he's in the fire, he's in the pit, he's on my side. And when Jesus is on the job, let me tell you, you can rest in his capable hands. Psalm 27, I wanna finish with this. Scripture says, the Lord is my light and my salvation. With that in mind, whom shall I fear? The Lord is the stronghold of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? When evil men advance against me to devour my flesh, when my enemies and my foes attack me, they will stumble and fall. Though an army besiege me, my heart will not fear. Though war break out against me, even then I will be confident. And he says, one thing I ask of the Lord. This is what I seek, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life. To gaze upon the beauty of the Lord and seek him in his temple. 
For in the day of trouble, he will keep me safe. I'm going to say that again. In the day of trouble, he will keep me safe in his dwelling. He will hide me in the shelter of his tabernacle and set me high upon the rock. Let's pray. God, I thank you, Lord, just for your character, your goodness. Lord, your faithful working in our lives. And Lord, I just pray, Lord, that the truth of your living word would come alive in our hearts today. God, that we would hang on to the truth. Lord, that you never leave. God, that you never forsake us. God, that you're with us. God, on the top of every mountain and in the lowest of every valley. God, that you are a safe place. That you are our refuge. That you are our shelter in the time of the storm. And Lord, in this season, God, that as your people, Lord, we would run to you. God, that we would turn to you, God, that we would find shelter in your presence. Lord, that, Lord, that you'd remind our hearts that you're with us and that you're working for our good. Even in the storm, even in the midst of things that we don't understand and things that we didn't see coming and situations that we didn't want to be in, God, even then, even when we don't see it, you're working. God, even when we don't feel it, Lord, you're working. God, we hang on to that truth. God, and we trust you. And we, we take a moment and we look back in the rearview mirror and realize how, how faithful you've been. And through all of those moments in the past, Lord, how you were carrying us and how you saw us through. And God, that that would just build our faith that the God who's been faithful with us in our yesterdays is the God who will be faithful today and faithful in our tomorrows. And Lord, I just pray, Lord, that you do a work, Lord, in this church. God, as this church, for every individual that is watching right now, God, that they just sense your presence and your goodness. Uh, God, for us as a church, for River Church, God, in this time that we didn't see coming and we didn't, we didn't plan for, God, in the middle of grand openings and Easter and all that stuff, Lord, I believe that that you can see things that we can't see and you know things that we don't know. And God, I believe you're going to show us, uh, God, how to rise up and be a light in the middle of this darkness. God, to be your hands and feet and minister to our communities and the people around us in a way that we could only do inspired by your Holy Spirit. So God, would you open our eyes, God, open our ears. And God, in this season, Lord, would we honor you. God, would we trust you and would our light so shine before men that they would see you living inside of us. God, that you would draw men unto yourself. God, that people who don't know you, that don't have this hope and this confidence in your goodness, God, would find you in the middle of this storm your precious holy name as you keep praying you know, there are likely many of you watching right now and you don't you don't have this inward hope this confidence you don't have this certainty your world's been just shaken and turned upside down because you don't have a personal relationship with Jesus and let me just tell you that more than anything else, you need a relationship with Jesus. You know, there, there might be some, some big needs out in front of you and you're wondering you know, how you're going to take care of your kids or, or how you're going to pay your bills. or you know, there, There's all these things. Let me tell you, your greatest need, our greatest need, is still our sin. It's still our souls that, that more than anything else, and that's the need that Jesus wants to meet for you today. It's why he went to the cross and died in your place so that he could forgive your sins, so that he could make you new, so that he could fill you with his spirit and his presence, that he could give you new purpose and new desires, the hope of eternity in heaven with him. And see, the reality is 
we've all sinned, every single one of us, we've all fallen short of God's glory, and the wages of that sin is death. But the gift that God offers us is eternal life through Jesus Christ. And as many of you, maybe you're watching and you know about God, but you don't really know Him in that personal way. Listen, God wants to know you to know Him today. He wants you to turn to Him. He wants you to find comfort in His presence. He wants to do a work in your heart and a life that you can't do on your own. He came and He died for you. He took the penalty of your sins upon the cross. Three days later, He rose from the grave. He's very much alive today. And the Bible says that anyone who calls on His name could be saved, could be forgiven, could be changed, could have hope and joy and love and peace. There's many of you that this is your time and this is your moment where you need to call on the name of Jesus. You need to confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead and you will be saved. And so I want to give you the opportunity to do that right now. If you're here, you're watching, you're realizing, Pastor, I need a relationship with Jesus. I'm ready to surrender my life to him, to, to invite him into my life. I want to lead you in this prayer. So if you would, Pray with me right now. Pray, Heavenly Father, thank you for loving me. I believe that you died for me so I could live for you. Today, I give my heart to you. I give my life to you. Jesus, I'm asking that you would forgive me of my sin, that you'd make me new and help me to live for you all the days of my life to trust in you to hope in you and God right now in the middle of the storm Lord you are my safe place I'm running to you in your precious name Amen